Happy unbirthday, everybody. Unless it's actually your birthday, in case, happy birthday, I guess. Don't know what an unbirthday is? Well, my good friend the Mad Hatter can explain it all to you. Once he's done fixing the White Rabbit's watch, of course. The Mad Hatter's animator is a master at the unusual and unexpected. A perfect fit for the nonsense of Disney's Alice in Wonderland. But who put the mad in Mad Hatter? Let's find out. Ward Kimball was born on March 4, 1914 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. His father was a salesman who traveled all around the country, making Ward attend many different schools. His love of art started in childhood. Really flower till I was in the fifth grade in Glendale, and they used to give a big Hershey bar. Remember those big ones, oh, thick sure. ones, all the nuts in it? Yeah, so and they the, had nuts in back then, yes, too. Yes, every half inch, Yep. not just three to the bar. I know. And they would give a, she would give a big Hershey bar, for the best drawing, and I never won, but one week I did. I drew a picture of an ocean liner. The other drawings were so lousy that I won, and from that point on, I became an artist. Ward went to the Santa Barbara School of the Arts in order to become a painter and illustrator. However, because of the Depression, you know, the great one, Ward was not able to travel to New York as he would like. Instead, Kimball's instructor at the school suggested that his work should be submitted to Walt Disney Productions and that he should pursue a career in animation. In March 1934, Ward Kimball applied for a job at the Disney Studio, and the following April, he was hired as an in-betweener. Well, I guess it's good that the Great Depression worked out for somebody. Ward's early work at Disney can be found in our previous episode, which you can find right here. So for this episode, we'll start in the late 40s with his work on Cinderella. World War II was over. Hooray! And Disney Studio was trying to find a new direction to save the studio from financial ruin? Not hooray! Cinderella became their answer, a return to feature-length movies and beautiful animation. Ward got the pleasure of animating Lucifer the Cat and the Mice, Jacques and Gus. Ward Kimball probably had the most fun of anybody on Cinderella. He got the cat, Lucifer. That was perfect casting because you could have never cast Ward Kimball on Cinderella. He would have fallen apart. He would not, not have enjoyed himself. <laughs> I didn't have to work making those very careful drawings of Cinderella and some of the other animators had to work on. And it was pure comedy. The old cat-mouse relationship. And my problem was to develop a cat that looked mean. He had some funny stories about uh, looking for a cat to be a, a personality like Lucifer, because they had mean cats and they had slinky cats and they had all different kind of cats drawn in the story sketches. Walt came out the house here one day and uh, our six-toed cat we call Feetsy was rubbing up against Walt's leg. And um, he said, for gosh sakes, Kimball, there's your cat. What are you worried about? And that's what led to my conception of the cat. At the time, he and I were playing in our Dixieland band, the Firehouse 5 Plus 2, and uh, they'd always introduce Ward as the one who had done the mice in the Cinderella, and everyone would go, oh! Then St. Frank there did the stepmother. <laughs> I said, we got to get another picture here, Ward. I can't take any more of this. And now it's time for a break in the action to present a Dizography fun fact. Did you know that Ward loved trains? As a boy, trains captivated him. So when a real train went on sale, Ward took his chance. Well, I heard that one of the railroads was selling one of its uh, 
second-hand passenger coaches, which was 40 feet long for 50 bucks. And uh, so I bought it. You know, see, I can't resist a bargain. That's Wouldn't it be cheaper to just uh, go on the train and go to Chicago and then have all this stuff in the backyard? Well, um, how much money have you got tied up in this uh, folly out there in the backyard? Huh? Well, I paid $400 for the big locomotive. That's 40 feet long, and I paid... You know what? You can go to Chicago and the Santa Fe for about $70. <laughs> As he grew older, he continued collecting different full-sized engines and coaches. Sugar cane cars in Hawaii. And you found it there? Right after the war, they decided to use trucks. Mm -hmm. And this was... We had two of them here at one time. But we have one left, and we steam this up. It's a wood burner, very easy. I can get steam in this thing in about 45 minutes, mm -hmm. take off. The big one back in the shed takes an hour and a half, mm -hmm. and it burns coal. But now, when you found this locomotive, it wasn't as pretty as it is now, huh? Oh, no, it was a rusty piece of junk. We had to put new tubes in the boiler, and I had to find a headlight. We had a photograph to go by from the Baldwin Locomotive Works. I had to find a bell. You know, and yeah, to, in order yeah, to restore yeah. it, we had to build this pilot from the blueprints. But at least you had a point of reference right, that right. You, so that what we see now is exactly as Baldwin turned it out in Philadelphia when they built it. Yes, it's a type they turned out. Uh, a light, a small wheel, mostly made for plantation. Mm -hmm. Does the number one mean anything here? That's our road number. Okay. <laughs> it's not the first locomotive in the world. This is number one. Uh, the big locomotive is number two. Probably if you got another one, it would be number three. We had a three, and that went to the Smithsonian. Oh, <laughs> to the Smithsonian? Yes. Was it that distinctive? A, a friend of mine, Jerry Best, had it, and he stored it here. And it was a plantation locomotive, and he's getting along in years. So they asked him, would he like to contribute his locomotive to the uh, museum? And he did. It's now up there on a pedestal in Railroad Hall. Wow. Tom, this is our old coach. You know, we were looking at it on the outside. Uh -huh. All the old original woodwork and the lamps should be polished, I suppose. Red plush seats. Are these, uh, uh, what, uh, kerosene? Yes, kerosene. That's all I had. The early lamps were candle and then kerosene, and they used gas. Mm -hmm. And up here is the old smoking compartment. It's hard to believe that you mean way back then, but before Proposition 5, they had this, huh? Yes, from 1840 <laughs> on. So this is your your section of the car, okay. Tom. Let's sit down here and then one a couple of the old seats. The original red plush, huh? All right. Don't you ever wonder who the people were that rode this coach from wherever to wherever and what they talked about and whether they were happy or unhappy? Or Sometimes I come out here on a quiet day and just sit and imagine all the different... Uh, passengers yeah. and what they would be doing and uh, the little kids are running up and down the aisle. Choo-choo, Kimball. Choo-choo. And back to Disney. Alice in Wonderland was the next project for Kimball. This was another film that was difficult for most of the crew, but not for Ward. He was given juicy assignments, such as Tweedledee and Tweedledum, the March Hare, as well as a few scenes of the walrus and the carpenter and the understated Cheshire cat. <laughs> You may have noticed that I'm not all there myself. <laughs> and the Morbaras outbreak. His most iconic character, however, is the Mad Hatter. Oh, what a delightful time! Is that thing happened? I'm so excited. We never get compliments. You must have a cup of tea. Arguably the best scene in the movie, and if you want to argue in the comments, go ahead and sound off. I mean, you're wrong, but sound off. Is the Mad Tea Party. Between Jerry Colonna and Ed Wynn's voice work, and the Mary Blair-esque backgrounds, the dialogue, the animation, even the framing, makes it an incredibly enduring and entertaining sequence. Ward Kimball wasn't the only animator who worked on the scene, though. There were actually quite a lot, including Cliff Nordberg, Mark Davis, Wooly Reitherman, Marvin Woodward, John Lounsbury, among others. Ward animated the introduction of the Mad Hatter and the March Hare scolding Alice for being rude. The Mad Hatter pouring tea on himself, and our favorite, the Mad Hatter fixing the White Rabbit's watch. I really like the Mad Hatter's reaction to the March Hare when the March Hare's like, Hey, why don't you put some mustard in that? Mustard, yes, but mustard? Don't let's be silly. <laughs> The Hatter reacts with this great alarm, and he tilts his head and does this weird little shrug thing with his shoulders and hips. That, that was animated by Ward, and it's definitely a nice touch. Not to mention his follow-up response is just... <laughs>
It's good. Lemon as different as Despite what it may look like, Kimball's not goofing around. He's really thinking about these characters and he's, he's making a statement with a pencil. All of his characters in Alice are thoroughly conceived, believable, and the acting is the best of the best. What sequence in Disney history is more entertaining and iconic than the mad tea party scene? It's sculptural drawing, exaggerated gestures and actions, integration of voice with character, understanding of emotions, use of technique, and draftsmanship. It's just so good. It's, it's out of this world. Some idea. <laughs> uh, you were saying that you would like to think... Pardon me. Uh, you were seeking uh, some information of some kind? Again, though, I mean, sound off in the comments if you disagree. I mean, you know, feel free to get heated. Unfortunately, Alice in Wonderland was a flop. This was for many reasons. Author Leonard Maltin notes that Ward Kimball felt the film failed because, and I quote, it suffered from too many cooks, directors. Here was a case of five directors each trying to top the other guy and make his sequence the biggest and craziest in the show. This had a self-canceling effect on the final product, unquote. Walt seems to have agreed, himself stating that the film wasn't great because there was no warmth in Alice's character. Man, if they thought this film was a flop, I'd hate to hear what they say about Mars Needs Moms. Like, you want to talk about some bad Disney flops? Oh, man. Like, I think even Home on the Range made some money back. Mars Needs Moms, I don't think that even made half its money back. Up next came Peter Pan, where Kimball had a bit of a hard time finding his place. He was by this point one of the few animators in the studio who never went to Milt Call for drawing advice, and therefore didn't acknowledge his influence on the Disney style. The animation was becoming less imaginative and straighter, making it harder for the man with the wild imagination to express himself. Kimball, by this film, was also rather bored with animation, and wanted to find a new challenge. So on Pan, he mainly focused on minor characters, such as the Indian Chief and some of the Lost Boys. While struggling to find his niche in the current environment in feature animation, Ward Kimball looked for other outlets for his creativity, and his first attempts were directing and animating in two groundbreaking musical shorts, Melody and Toot, Whistle, Pluck, and Boom. Both were huge successes and were the first Disney films ever to use limited animation. In 1954, the animator moved out of feature animation altogether and moved upstairs to work on the space series for the Disneyland TV show. I was so relieved to get away from animation. I knew how to do it. I wanted to have some say about the content. And that's exactly what he found because in the space series, he embraced a creative freedom very few artists have ever had in the animation industry. Those were the happiest moments of my life. Uh, uh, I did the space pictures with Willie Lay and Von Braun because they were the they came over from Germany after the war was over. He did to produce and uh, were our speakers. The payload in the top section will consist of ten crew members plus equipment. I introduced the first one. That was man in space, what happens to you if you didn't wear a space suit? And you freeze on one side, and you melt on the other. He would soon broil on the one side and freeze on the other. When uh, President Eisenhower saw man in space, he realized that none of his generals in the Pentagon knew what it was all about. And would you believe he asked Walt if he could borrow a print of that picture to run f for the brass in the Pentagon. He flew them all in for a couple of weeks and ran this every day. And I always got a kick out of that. And then, then Mars and beyond. Mars is very populated with luminous birds who do not fly. Ward was a great animator and an interesting individual. Sure, a lot of people like trains and collect them, but how many can boast an entire collection of real trains? Just him. Not only that, but he persevered through the Great Depression in order to make his dreams come true. Now, thanks to him, we're able to come face to face with fascinating characters that he helped bring to life. In the words of the Mad Hatter, Two days slow, that's what it is. Thank you for watching this episode of Dizographies. Click the thumbs up button below if you liked it, and if you want to be notified when the next episode comes out, consider subscribing. Comment below with characters you would like to see us cover. Further reading and references are linked in the description. We hope to see you in another Dizography.